When you're learning a new song, I know this is counterintuitive, just be loud. Even if you butcher it, just be loud, because we're all equally learning it here. Okay? It's such a good song. And uh, so watch the lyrics as I'm doing it the first time. about God's dwelling place. Think about a temple. What things are elements of a temple? Let's go ahead and just play class for a moment. What the things... Ark. What, huh? The ark. The ark. Okay, good. Whoops, that doesn't work. So the ark, super important. The altar. The ark. The altar. What else do we have? What do we find in the temple? Okay. Courtyards. Okay, courtyards, good. The sea. Uh, what'd you say? The sea. Brass sea. You see a brass where they cleanse themselves and... Oh, okay, got it. Okay, yeah. so brass cleansing? Yeah. Good, good, good. 
the uh, candlesticks. Yeah. Okay, so these are basically the items: candlesticks. Good, good, good. Now let's go even larger and macro. Uh, so those are the items that are being done by somebody. Who is who's the somebody? Yeah, the priest. So you have priests. Oh, I see. Yeah, right. You have priests. Okay, and um, you're saying a temple. It could be a rabbi. Okay, good. Right, right, right. I, I'm thinking more of the Old Testament, you yeah, know, right. like the, the sanctuary and, and all of that, but sure. Priest or rabbi? Sure. Rabbi is just teacher. Good. What else would you have? The temple workers. Temple workers? So in that case, we're talking the Levites. Okay. Do they have musicians? Musicians, also under the Levites. Yeah. So musicians. Okay, now what else would we find in the Bible about a temple? Yeah. A priestess. Priestess. No, you wouldn't, actually. <laughs> you would if it was a, a pagan temple. Uh, anything else? Uh, worshippers? Huh? Worshippers? Sure, worshippers. <laughs> You'd have the, the, the divisions, the separations yeah. of like holy places and the holy of holies. Okay, right. So, courtyard. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, that's fine. Yeah. You know, whole, uh, holy place and then the holy of holies. The canter? Yeah. Uh, yeah, canter, good. Uh, now, what about, there's one thing even larger, so we're looking inside it. If we look outside, we've got, you know, the courtyard, holy place. So, okay, we already did it, kind of answer that. We've actually got the building itself. Yeah. So, let's call this the building, let's call this what happens inside the building, and then let's call this uh, the items that are being used. And again, this is kind of, this is actually all one big thing. So these are the people. Okay, good. Are that works pews, pretty neat. The pews where people sit. Yeah, exactly. All of it. Perfect. So, <clears throat> check it out. Um, what I'm trying to help you understand is this idea that um, Jeff talked about last week. I want you to understand that you are the mystery. You are the mystery. Okay? In three different ways. First thing is, I'm going to hit four, three things, okay? Four buildings, four priesthoods, two messiahs. And when I say two messiahs, I'm being controversial. That is a misnomer that existed, but, okay, four, four, two. Okay, the first thing is there, and, and I was just like riffing on this just as a Jewish boy, right? So first temple that was ever talked about was actually the tabernacle. So we're talking Ezekiel 25 through 31 and 35 through 40, okay? That's 453 verses on just the tabernacle. Has anyone ever read that and read the ridiculous amount of detail? Ooh, like, yeah. it's painful, right? Yeah. Like, you are bored out of your wits. I mean, they're talking the exact measurements. They're talking the angle of a palm branch. I mean, it's nuts. A cubit and a this and a that. And a, oh, you want to, like, you, right? <clears throat> Have you ever seen a design that wasn't completely thought out? Have you ever been a part of that? Whether it's a book or a movie or a building or a car, where you got a part to repair your car and there wasn't really complete plans, right? Mm -hmm. Good. So when you see that detail, have you ever thought about, is there a positive way to spin that detail, anyone? When you see ridiculous detail in design, what would be a positive way of spinning that? Well, whoever is making it really cares. There you go. <laughs> right, you with it? Right? So don't read, like, the list of names. Okay, on the tabernacle, I mean, God went crazy about the dude that did the artwork. He said, this is the guy who's going to do it. This is exactly who's going to do it. And he keeps mentioning this guy's name. I mean, that tells me, you, you're my man. <laughs> you do that. This matters to me. This guy, everyone, this guy. That's incredible amount of love. The designer cares. That's almost like, I mean, if Spielberg says, only this person, that's my cinematographer, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> Solomon's Temple. 1 Kings 6 through 8, 2 Chronicles 3 through 7. 276 verses. Ridiculous detail on the building. By the way, the tabernacle goes into uh, what the first thing I was talking about with the 453 verses. We're talking about all of this. Who's doing it? Who's doing exactly what? Who's doing exactly what? When? What do they need to do it? What 
items do they do? In what order? I mean, it's everything. How, how many how many utensils had to be there? Whether they were made of gold or brass or silver or wood? Exactly. Yeah. Fantastic, right? So I'm now trying to the details. fact that we're pooling our knowledge right now is fantastic. Great, Lewis. You know, so the, like so much detail. So this, so first we have 453 verses, then we have 276 verses, uh, and that's just Solomon's temple. Now you know what's crazy? 784 verses for the one that Haggai and Ezra and Nehemiah were a part of. I mean, I'll double, triple from Solomon's temple. So that's the temple that Jesus appeared in. And at first it was really kind of lame. Uh, it was really, really modestly built. It was kind of like, <laughs> kind of embarrassing, like in Haggai. But then Herod refurbished it and made it like, whoa. Herod the Great, there were several Herods. Okay? And, and the verses there, just for record, Ezra 1 through 10, Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah 1 through 13, 2 Chronicles 36, verses 22 and 23, Malachi 3 1, Zechariah chapters 1 through 4, and Haggai. All right? So that's the second one. Now, there's a fourth temple. That is, uh, doesn't ha has not happened yet, and that's Ezekiel's. Okay, so that's uh, well, it's where is that? Hello. So that is Ezekiel, the Millennial Temple, forty through forty-eight. Okay, that's two hundred sixty verses. Now, add all that together, that's one thousand seven hundred seventy-three verses total about temple in the Old Testament. But then something crazy happens. So if we can have that first verse up. Stephen, with somebody very important watching, said, this is right before they stoned him. Uh, However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says what you just sang. And who's the prophet? Isaiah 66, chapter, verse 1. Heaven is my throne and earth is my, is my footstool. What kind of house are you going to build for me, says the Lord? Or what place <laughs> is there for me? So, and he, Stephen goes on to say, God doesn't dwell in the temple. So why all these verses in the Old Testament? Yeah, if the Shekinah went into, by the way, this is interesting, into the first two, but the Shekinah never actually appeared in the third temple. Neither was the ark found. So that's very intriguing. That's for a later study. So if that's true, and you want to know something? Guess who was impressed by that message? A Pharisee by the name of was sitting there when Stephen got stoned. And look what he said on Mars Hill after he got saved. He quoted Stephen. I just noticed that. I had never noticed that. The God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands. Okay, so where does God dwell then? Look at Ephesians 2. Now we're getting the mystery. This is talking about y'all. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Whoa. Take a look at, um, and this is throughout, Take a look at uh, 1 Corinthians 3.16. Don't you know that you're a temple of, <laughs> of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? That's kind of direct. <laughs> Duh, don't you know? Because they're not treating their bodies as temples. They're defiling them. They're acting like Antiochus Epiphanes, who sacrificed pork on the altar and put a big statue of Zeus up in the middle of the temple, which is why they had eight days of dedication, which, by the way, Solomon did for his temple as well. So Hanukkah, though it's not required, Hanukkah literally means dedication. So Hanukkah, though not required in the Old Testament, is still something that's referred to as existing. In fact, Jesus did things during the festival of dedication. Um, so then, looking at 1 Corinthians 6, 16. Don't you know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For yes, That's what I wrote. And then 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, that you are not your own? Okay, so, for, so Colossians 1. Okay. What is the mystery? Let me just put this up. 
My bad. Colossians 1 says, this was from last week, 1, 26 and 27. The mystery hidden for ages, this is a big deal, the mystery was hidden for ages and generations, but it's now revealed to his saints, which just means called out ones, which is y'all. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles, not my lineage, your lineage, the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you. Temple, the hope of glory. You have the Shekinah dwelling in you. So, <clears throat> that's the four buildings, four priesthoods. So you have the Aaronic priesthood, Aaron. Later, when the law was given through Moses, Aaron's brother, you had the Levites. They were the priesthood in terms of all the workers and many, many other functions, right? But typically, your high priest was taken out of the Aaronic priesthood. You have Melchizedek, which is a very singular priest, happens to be the lineage, well, actually, it was Jesus back then. Okay? Um, and then you have something else. I want to show you something to give you the idea of how mystical the priesthood is. I want you to understand, because where I'm going with this is that you're the priesthood. Take a look at what the priesthood actually is. Ancient and powerful blessing that leads to the first Kohen Gadol, the high priest of biblical Israel. The Birkat Kohanim, which means the priestly blessing, is found in the Torah. God instructs Moses to tell Aaron and his sons, the first priest, If your last name's Cohen, your lineage is from Aaron. Okay? So anybody you know, a Jewish person by the name of Cohen, they actually leave at the end of every uh, temple service, and you're about to see it, and they have to go through a special ceremony. So when your last name's Cohen, you're born into some sort of super, super, super special, special, special deal. And I didn't even realize this, even because I grew up in a super liberal form of Judaism. So I'm actually doing high holiday services because they pay opera singers to be soloists for high holiday, right? So I'm on Long Island, and then I see these guys doing this. So go ahead and watch what the, this is about the ironic blessing that the last name Cohen does. Go ahead. Here's a way to bless Israel. And then these words are given. Yivarechacha Hashem v'yishmerecha. May God bless you and protect you. Ya'er Hashem panave lecha v'chuneka. May God shine the divine face towards you and love you. Yisa Hashem panave lecha v'yasem lecha shalom. May God lift up the divine face towards you and grant you peace. For some communities, it becomes perhaps the most dramatic moment of the communal prayer service. Towards the end of the service, on cue, people in the congregation who are Kohanim exit the sanctuary. The Livi'im ritually wash the hands of the Kohanim. The Kohanim then return to the sanctuary without shoes on, as the ancient priests would have done. They cover themselves with their prayer shawls and raise their hands in the shape of the Hebrew letter Shin. During the blessing, the congregation gathers under their prayer shawls. This hand sign was the inspiration for the actor Leonard Nimoy, whose character Spock on Star Trek held up his hand in this same way. Nimoy had strong childhood memories of peeking out from under his father's prayer shawl. Go underneath their talus and get this blessing. So they're dominating, which is this thing, right? which is kind of what you see the guys at the Western Wailing Wall do. <clears throat> but you watch that and you're like, what? <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost laughable, it's so weird looking. 
And I'm like, what are they doing? And I had to have the, the cantor explain to me, oh no, they're Cohen's, Cohenim, and they're giving the blessing, and only they can give that blessing. And I'm like, whoa. So the other thing that was crazy when I was in temple is that when they open up the ark, it's not the real ark, and they take out the Torah, it's not the real Torah, and they walk down the aisle, everyone's taking their, um, their talis, kissing the edge of it, and trying desperately to touch the Torah. Like people are like crawling over each other in the aisles to touch the Torah. And it reminds me of the story where uh, the woman has the issue of blood and she, she can just touch the hem of Jesus' garment that she'll be healed. So there's this kind of panicky. And the reason I'm talking about this is because this is what temple's like. Temple is this, is this kind of that kind of singing all the time. And everyone knows when to sing. And it's really beautiful, but kind of mystical. You don't really understand what's going on. And then these kinds of things happen. Guess what, guys? That's us. Four priesthoods, ironic. So now us, here's the fourth. First Peter 2, 4 and 9. And coming to him is a living stone which has been rejected by people, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Um, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of whom who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Isaiah even says this. You will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of nations and boast of... And then Revelation. This is, uh, this is John talking to all of us. He has made us into a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. So Jesus has done this to us and for us. To him be the glory and the dominion forever. And then Jesus himself says this at the end. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these the second death has no power. But there will be priests of God and of Christ. And will reign for him for a th with him for a thousand years. Okay, so that's kind of freakish stuff. That we're actually priests like that serving in the temple. <clears throat> so, and that's a mystery. Check this out. Go ahead and put that next slide. The Jews in the Old Testament were very confused by, there's around 574 prophecies or verses regarding Messiah. And they roughly divide themselves into a suffering Messiah, the circle with the crown of thorns, and then the victorious Messiah, the crown, the victorious crown. So actually, many of the Old Testament um, scholars, uh, people like Gamaliel and Hillel, um, thought there were going to be two separate messiahs. One that would suffer, and another one that would uh, fulfill ruling on the throne of David. You know, I'm thinking of Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, you know, sit at my, uh, sit at my side until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. You know, <laughs> conquering. So there's less verses about conquering, roughly a third of them. Two-thirds of them were fulfilled in the suffering Messiah. Specific, like real specific. And I can give you ad nauseum uh, website sources that show you specifically where those prophecies are and how they were fulfilled. Um, but what's crazy is that it's one Messiah that bridges both. So prophetically speaking, we're now referring to this verse. 1 Peter 10. Let me read this verse to you while she's calling up the next slide. 1 Peter 1, 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched and carefully investigated. They inquired into what time or what circumstances the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified in advance of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Two Messiahs, suffering and glory, right there in Peter's verse 11. So there weren't two, there's one, bridged by two advents, two appearances. But check it out before I get to something even bigger than this. The prophets who had the spirit within them were writing stuff down they couldn't figure out. The mystery was too much of a big deal. A suffering Messiah and then a glorious Messiah? Going on, verse 12. It was revealed to these prophets that they were not serving themselves but you. 
These things have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the in the book of Colossians again this, this week, uh, starting off where we left off, but now we're going to be in chapter 2. I actually really like uh, that we were able to take a look at this, this idea of us being the temple and, and that we're now actually the new, new priesthood of uh, being a mediators between God and mankind, uh, because we we did discuss that a little bit last week, um, of it being a mystery of Christ in us. Um, and now what Paul is actually going to do is reach out to this, this church Colossae and actually address them, uh, the whole church, what his goals are for them to be. So we'll actually get to see you know, now that not only are, um, is the temple our bodies, but us as, uh, us as a collective, as the church, um, it can be the temple as well, uh, as God is seeking to use each of us. Uh, yeah. Alright, so we'll just start uh, looking right at what Paul says here in the beginning uh, during Colossians chapter 2 verse 1. Uh, and actually, if we just quickly remember back, he had just talked about his, uh, his labor for them uh, and all the things that he was doing um, to serve them and uh, his desire to uh, be with them. And so now he's going to explain even more from his point of view, really, uh, what's going on. So he says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on, be on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face. Uh, so first thing I want to notice here is the word struggle that he gives there. It's, it's the word agon uh, in Greek, and that's where we get our word agony, or agonizing. And it's actually used of athletes. So he has this struggle that um, is going on inside of him for these people. <laughs> uh, it's, for, it's for the Colossians, and then we see it's for the, the people in Laodicea as well. Um, and so when I think of this word, I actually think of when I was in uh, junior high and high school, I was in this <laughs> sport. I wasn't super big into sports, but I was in a sport called track. <laughs> That's all right. um, so it's, it basically had to do with a lot of running. And I did some jumping and that kind of thing too, but mostly I was a runner. Um, and usually when you say, oh, I was in track, people ask you if you were in like, short distance running or long distance running. Uh, and I was actually kind of right in the middle, which is kind of like the worst place to be. Because um, you have to run like a pretty decently long distance, but a lot of the kids that are in really good shape are actually able to keep up a pretty high speed. Um, for that, so I actually ran the 400 and the 800. So the 400, that's a quarter of a mile, and then the 800 is half of a mile. Um, and so if you're running, you know, half of a mile trying to beat these other kids, it's pretty tough. Um, and so I, I hated the 800. I was uh, either was feeling really bad afterward, just wanted to go home, go to sleep immediately. Um, uh, but uh, one thing that me and my friends would do is when we were getting to like the final stretch. Uh, we were, you know, obviously just exhausted from running the, pretty much almost the whole race by that point. And we were so exhausted that to be able to get through the final stretch, we would just yell as loud as we could. Um, that way it just kind of gave us a burst of energy to finish strong. Um, and it kind of freaked out the other runners as well, so it kind of <laughs> gave us a little bit of an edge there. Because they'd look over like, why is that guy yelling? Um, that's kind of what I think of as, as agony. It's, it's used for athletes when they're in their competition, they're trying to to win these different, uh, you know, like the Olympic Games. Um, so they would use this word agon, which is for agonizing. They're really struggling to compete. So that's what I think of when I would just be yelling, I'm struggling to, to finish this race, so it's, it's an agonizing uh, feeling inside of me. Um, but that's what's going on with Paul. He's, he's really desiring for um, you know, them to, to reach what God has for them. Um, and we'll notice back in the verse, uh, he says, for all those who have not personally seen my face. Um, interesting fact, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but uh, Paul has never been to this church 
in Colossae or in Laodicea as well. He's never been to these places. Uh, he's only heard from uh, one of his associates, Epaphras, of what's going on here. Uh, that's why he's writing this. Epaphras has gone to Paul and said, hey, there's false teachers that are in here. Uh, they're basically putting people under some of the Old Testament laws. They're diminishing Jesus' work. You need to write these people a letter and set them straight. So Paul doesn't necessarily know very many people here. He says there's definitely those who have not personally seen my face. Um, but Paul is writing that he has a struggle going on on their behalf. Um, so he wants this church to really reach their full potential in Christ. Um, and so really he wants their church to be effective. That's what we're going to look at, how, how to have an effective church. And he gives them five goals uh, that they're going to need to reach to have an effective church. Uh, so the first goal he gives them is to have encouraged hearts. Have encouraged hearts. Uh, verse 2 starts out, that their hearts may be encouraged. That their hearts may be encouraged. Uh, so the word encouraged there is parakaleo. Parakaleo. And it means actually to come alongside. When the, we had this uh, teacher at Bible College, whenever he would talk about the word encouraged and come alongside, he would do this motion with his hands. I don't know what this has to do with coming alongside, but this is what he would do. And I, I think he just means like either coming alongside one of your, your pals, your associates. Um, yeah, parallel. So alongside. Here, it's a parallel. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. You're coming alongside wherever mm -hmm. the person is. Yeah, you're coming alongside. So he would do that motion. And yeah, I guess it does fit now that I think about it, but oh. it means to come alongside. And interesting thing, this word parakaleo, uh, which it's on the next slide if you want to go. Um, Jesus, in John 14, 16, um, he actually talks about the Holy Spirit. Uh, he says, I will ask the Father, this is actually him talking to the, the disciples, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. And so the, the word for helper here is parakletos, parakletos. So you can see the similarities there in, the, in this Greek word. The word that he's using for Holy Spirit, it's translated helper here, but it's the same idea. The Holy Spirit is coming alongside the believers to be able to help us uh, what, what we need to do in the Christian life. Uh, so the question is, how do we get these encouraged hearts? Uh, because he's, he's asking that their hearts may be encouraged. Uh, well, I, I found a few different ways. First way is to study God's Word. Uh, here's a verse Psalm 19.8. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. If we really want to be encouraged, we need to be studying God's Word. And I think that's one of the main reasons we come to church is to be able to hear a little bit, what, you know, what does God have for me from his word that I can um, either learn something new or be reminded of something old um, or go on, go on through the week with, with just a little bit from God's word. Um, and so we have you know, an example, like I, I'm talking about the word right now. Uh, we had Drew talking about something. I'm sure a lot of us, that was a lot of new things that we haven't really touched on before. We're not super familiar with the, temp the way the temple would work. Um, and so just different things like that to get a bigger insight of God's word. Uh, for me, it's very, very encouraging. Um, then another way we can be encouraged uh, is just by being around the body of Christ. Uh, Hebrews 10, 24 says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And then verse 25, it goes on to say, not forsaking our own assembly together, uh, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more you see the, the day drawing here. So, I want to stimulate one another to loving good deeds, and right after, not forsaking our own assembling together. So those two phrases are connected there. Uh, when we're able to come together as a body, that's when we're able to encourage one another to keep on. You know, how, in what ways can we serve? In what ways, ways can we share God's word? It's all part of being together as the church. Um, so definitely, being a part of a local body like we are, that's uh, very important for each, each person individually. Uh, to have an, an effective church. If we're if we're scattered, we're not meeting together. Um, you know, we're we're not going to be as effective as we could be. Um, then third way is going to be prayer. Prayer. I, I mean, I'm, I think with this church especially, we take a big focus on prayer. We want to invite God into everything that we do. Uh, so we always start each morning uh, with with prayer in the morning before church. Uh, we have prayer throughout our, our service as well. Uh, and so yeah, definitely very important, and it, it can be encouraging because if we know that the rest of the body is, is praying for us, uh, that we can we can really go out uh, in the day confident that God is actually going to be working in, in my life. Uh, 
And for example, this morning I prayed that, or I didn't pray, but I asked for prayer because, uh, for those that don't know, we got two newborns at home. Uh, so they a lot of times can deprive us of some sleep. Uh, so right now I'm okay. I'm not falling asleep before you, but um, later today I'll be a struggle. I'm going to have to really depend on uh, on God, depend on your prayers to just help me go to work today. So, um, but yeah, so yeah, prayer is very important. We can ask our fellow believers of prayer and know that God is going to work um, through their prayers. So first thing we have to do, or the first goal we have is. As, uh, to be an effective church is to, to encourage one another. We need to encourage each other's hearts. Um, the second goal that we have is to be knit together in love. Knit together in love. So, looking back at verse 2, he says that their hearts may be encouraged having been knit together in love. So he's actually saying this about the Colossians. They are already knit together in love. Uh -oh. But for us, we can actually view that as meaning to be unified, or having unity. You have you know, the idea of being knit together. Some of your versions probably do say, um, you know, to be unified or have unity. But the idea of being knit together, I don't know how to knit. Any knitters in here? Oh, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, knitting together, whatever, <laughs> scarf, blanket, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, all those different strains are being pulled together and, and tied together. They're not going to be pulled apart. And so. Uh, for this church, that's what what Paul is telling them. I want you to be unified. You need to be unified. Uh, and so the false teachers, they actually were trying to cause division, but Paul wanted unity. If you remember what we talked about last week, a little bit about these false teachers is they claimed that they had like a higher knowledge that only they knew. They, was, they were called the Gnostics. The word Gnostic comes from the word to know. So they had a higher knowledge that just the average Christian didn't have. So. If they could, you know, join that group, you know, come join our group and we'll, we'll give you the higher knowledge that, that you need to have. Um, and then also they caused division by putting people into the Old Testament law. So, um, you know, some of the believers said, no, faith alone, Christ alone. Some, and these false teachers said, okay, yeah, faith is good, but also do this. Uh, so obviously that's going to cause some division. But Paul wanted to correct those false doctrines and make sure that they were unified. Um, and I also wanted to look at, uh, in, the, in the book of John, in chapter 17, we see a prayer that Jesus makes. Um, they call this the high priestly prayer. Uh, but really, I think it's just a prayer, prayer from Jesus. I'm sure you pray things like this all the time. Uh, but he says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, some of the disciples, I'm not only asking for the disciples, but for those who would believe in me through their word. So I'm not only asking for the disciples, but for those that would believe through the word. So that's us. We believed through the disciples' word. Uh, so what is he praying for us? He's praying that they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. So we can kind of just go through that quickly, but he says that for all believers, for those that would believe from the disciples' word, that they would all be one. That is the idea of unity. We're not to look at ourselves as just Okay, well, I'm, you know, I do this ministry in this part of the church. Drew, you can do that. You know, Lois, Richard, you do this. Uh, we'll all just do our own thing in church. But no, we are supposed to come together and uh, do ministry together, worship God together. Um, and that, that oneness that we're supposed to have is going to be very, very strong. Because he even says that, he says, they will be one even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Uh, that they also may be in us. So, Think of the unity that Jesus has with the Father. That's an extremely, extremely close unity that they have. That's the same unity that he wants us to have as believers. Uh, where we, we look at each other as if, as if we're the same person. I care about you that much um, as a fellow believer. Um, so how can we have unity in the church? Well, Paul actually discusses this a lot. This is not the only place where he talks about unity in the church. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3 this is being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So being diligent. This isn't something that happens automatically, but this is something we need to strive for and be diligent for. Uh, preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So it has to do with making peace. Uh, if there's any kind of disagreements or arguments that happen between us, that's okay. There's going to be disagreements. There's going to be uh, you know, different arguments here and there, but we need to make sure that we make peace. 
you know, even after disagreement, it doesn't end with hostility, but it ends with peace. Um, that is something that we have to uh, be diligent to do. Uh, so, verse, uh, same chapter, but later, verse 32, it says, Being kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one, each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So, this has to do with forgiveness. Um, just as God has forgiven us in Christ, we are to forgive others. Uh, even in a church setting, uh, there's sin that happens. Uh, we can sin against each other. We can hurt each other's feelings. Uh, but there's supposed to be forgiveness there. Uh, and of course, being kind to one another, tenderhearted. So that's, that's real forgiveness. Uh, and then actually, in Philippians, he speaks specifically of, of two women. These names are a little bit uh, hard, so... Um, Especially for me, my name is Jeff. It's like such an easy <laughs> one. You get names like this, it's a little bit difficult. But Yo Iodia? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I think it's Sinti. Sinti. Yeah, Sinti. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, but he's saying, hey, you and you, <laughs> I urge you to live in Sorry. harmony in the Lord. I urge you to live in harmony in the Lord. Um, so obviously, there was some kind of disagreement here, and there was hostility. But he's like, no, you guys need to come together, live in harmony, stop your disagreements. And then earlier in Philippians, uh, he says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Well, this is, I think, the most important thing when it comes to being unified is, uh, you know, we're not going to be just thinking about ourselves and what we can gain, how we can profit, but we're going to be looking at each other and thinking, all right, how can I, uh, you know, help this person? How can I see these other people as more important than, than myself. It's not all about me, it's about, it's about others. Um, so what are the some of the benefits um, of unity, unity in the church? Well, I think sharing Christ with others. Uh, let's look back at that prayer that uh, Jesus made. Notice at the end, so that, they, or so that the world may believe that you sent me. So that the world may believe that you sent me. Um, a lot of times we think that we're going to be able to um, share Christ, which this this happens, but we share Christ just by loving them, and that's all we do. But we also share Christ by loving each other. Uh, for example, so many people, after we had these two newborns, they asked me, like, oh, do you guys have any family in the area? No, we don't. Because <laughs> they're, they're wondering, like, oh, who's going to help you take care of all these babies? Uh, well, we don't have any family in the area, but I can tell them, Oh, well, we have a lot of people at our church that have been helping out, bringing over meals, uh, you know, paying for some of our groceries, things like that, uh, which is a giant help to us. And that's a, a, a witness of what the church is able to do. Like, oh, wow, you're, this church is actually a church that is, is caring for people and helping people out. It's not, you know, just a church that's there to, you know, condemn sinners and tell people that they need to repent. Like, no, that's, that's not what the church is there for. It's there to share truth and, and to love. Um, so I think that's a good example of when we do things like that. It's um, it's not just so that we can be unified and be effective in ministry, um, but it's so that it's, it's a witness to others when, when we're able to help each other in that way. And, and that's what Jesus is saying right here in his prayer, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Uh, so second goal that we need to have is, is being knit together in love, having that unity. Uh, our third goal is we need to have a a full understanding of Christ. Full understanding of Christ. So, going into what what uh, Drew was saying is, we really want to have that full understanding. We need to know the all that stuff like that about how you know the believers in the Old Testament they were looking forward to a yeah suffering Messiah, but they were looking forward to a, um, a a conquering King as well, and that is that is the Jesus that we serve. So we want to have that full understanding of Christ. Um, and he uh, he goes on to say. Uh, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasure, treasures and wisdom and knowledge. I say this so no one will delude you with persuasive argument. So, first thing I want to look at uh, is actually just a little bit about what the false teachers were doing, because they attacked two, two major things. First thing was Christ's deity, and the second thing was the sufficiency of his death. So what I mean by deity is the fact that he is God, his divinity, his Godhood. 
uh, the sufficiency of his death. What I mean by that is, if his death is sufficient, then that means that his death was enough. It was enough to forgive all of our sins. Um, if his death wasn't sufficient, that means it wasn't enough. That means we have to add something else to it, a work or a, anything like that. We need to do an extra work or go to church, pray, something that we have to add onto Christ's work. And I put that, these are the most important parts of the gospel. The fact that Jesus is God. That's why he was able to make this sacrifice. The fact that his death was sufficient. So all we have to do is believe. You know, very, very important that these two things are maintained. And if you actually look at all the different cults and different religions that claim to be Christian, but aren't, these are, one, are two of the areas they attack. Either they bring Jesus a little bit lower to being a created being, or they look at his death and they bring that a little bit lower and say, okay, well, yes, believe, but also here's some other things that we have to do as well. To all the different false religions that are out there today, they're not, actually not that new. They do the same thing that the Gnostics were doing uh, back in, in this time period. This is 60 AD. They're doing the same exact thing. They're attacking the fact that Jesus is God and they're adding things onto Jesus' work. Uh, looking back at verse 2, uh, he says, attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. So there's, there's a wealth of knowledge there. And I want us to look at the full assurance of understanding. Uh, when, you, when you hear the word assurance, what do you think of if I'm assured? Confidence? Yeah, you're confident. Yeah, yeah, perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. You need to be confident in what you believe. Um, one thing that I've uh, thought of in my Christian life is making sure, like I wanted to be absolutely sure that I was going to be in heaven. Because uh, I did actually listen to some sermons online that uh, were by people that were kind of twisting different verses around, basically saying, oh, well, if you're not living the way that you're supposed to, then that means you're not saved. And so I really struggled with that, um, knowing whether I was saved or not. But here's a verse that really clears that up, John 5, 13. And actually, I think Bradley shared this maybe two or three weeks ago, but he says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. This is John writing to believers. We know he's writing to believers because he's saying these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Why is he writing? So that you may know that you have eternal life. He's writing to these people so that they can know you have eternal life. So we have that ability to actually know that we have it, not just hope we have it or I believe and yeah, someday hopefully I will be able to make it into heaven. But yeah, we can know right now we have eternal life. And Jesus is the same way in John chapter 6, verse 47. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Amen. It can't get more simple than that. And notice, he's not saying he who believes will have eternal life, but he's saying has eternal life right now. That's present tense. So if you're a believer, your eternal life has already started. So you can't, can't get more confident than that. Amen. It's not like, okay, yes, be, you know, because I'm a Christian, I get to have eternal life. But no, it's already started right now. Uh, my, my life with God has already started. So that is the assurance I think that uh, uh, the Bible gives us. Um, we can be 100% confident that if, if we put our trust in Christ for our salvation, uh, that we will be in, in heaven one day. Um, so looking back at verse 2, it uh, says, From the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. So now he actually refers to you know, this true knowledge of God's mystery is it's just being the person of Christ, uh, the person of, of Jesus. Um, they knew a little bit about Jesus back in the Old Testament. They, and like Drew was saying, so okay, there's going to be this person that suffers. This is going to be a Messiah, but we also know there's going to be a king. We don't want our king to be suffering, so uh, that's probably where the idea came from. There's going to be two different Messiahs. Um, you know, they, they have such a different, uh, different role in God's timeline. Uh, but now, he, yeah, he, he says this mystery, if you remember last week, our definition of mystery, it was something that was uh, hidden in the Old Testament, but now it's been revealed. Now we know, yes, Jesus was a suffering, suffering servant that died on the cross. Uh, but he is going to, to come and reign uh, in the future. He says, in Jesus, verse 3, he says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So you think all, all the treasures, really all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? Um, or in Jesus? No, well, yeah. We know that Jesus is, is God in human form. If you really want to get to know God and, and what God is like, 
just keep on studying what is Jesus like. Um, us as human beings, it's, it is hard to fully comprehend um, God, but Jesus gives us an even bigger, pic better picture of what God is like. Um, so the Bible has all we need to know. Uh, and it's kind of interesting that he says this because the false teachers, like I said before, they claimed that they were the only ones that had hidden knowledge. Well, or Paul says here that, yeah, actually the hidden knowledge is, is found in Jesus. Everything you need to know is in Jesus. It's not, not with these false teachers. They, they have knowledge, but it's, it's not what you want. You want the, the knowledge that comes from Jesus. Um, so he kind of uses their own, own language back on them. Uh, which Paul does that actually quite quite often, so it's kind of funny um, when you when you're able to find something like that. Um, in verse verse four, he says, "I say this so no one will delude you with persuasive argument." Uh, so another attack on those false preachers. He's like, "Hey, I'm telling you this so that you're not going to be dissuaded by these man-made arguments." Um, it's actually kind of interesting because the, uh, the the word that she's using here for persuasive argument uh, is actually something that they would use in uh, a legal defense. Uh, <coughs> Mike, can I actually have you get me a cup or a bottle of water? Because I'm so to get a drink for I meant to drink one. I actually brought one up here during youth group on Wednesday. I never even drank it. <laughs> I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll just put it back. <laughs> Been there, man. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take off the mask. <laughs> The scary thing is that you can get diluted. That's scary. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so this <clears throat> word that she's using here for persuasive argument, um, it was used of, uh, of in court when they would really give, all right, here's my, my arguments of why you're wrong and why I'm right. And so it's not just, you know, like really easy to always just decline what these false teachers are saying. Sometimes these are really good. Uh, arguments and defenses of what they're saying. That's why it's really important to study God's word well. Uh, and you can, I mean, just just look at outside the word. There's so much false teaching out there that uh, we need to be protected from, and not necessarily just false teaching on the Bible, but uh, just everything the world says. Even the the secular world that isn't isn't religious at all has false message messages that are are coming at us constantly. Uh, and so I really have a, a burden for young people especially because um, you know, who's going to guide them to know or what's right, what's wrong? Uh, you know, who, can I, who can I trust? Who can I believe? Uh, so nice thing is, is that we know that the Bible is, is God's word and it can be trusted. Uh, and he, he says simply right there that all the, uh, all the knowledge and wisdom you need is, is found right, right in, in the Bible, right from the person of Christ himself. Uh, so yeah, we have all the knowledge we could ever need from God's Word. Uh, so, the next goal that we need to do if we are going to be an effective church is to develop discipline. Develop discipline. He says, for even though I am absent in body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Uh, so, if you remember from last week, he's writing this from a Roman prison. He's not actually able to go visit them in person. So that's why he's in there. I'm, I'm absent in body, but I'm with you in spirit. I'm right there with you. I mean, he's glad to see, uh, you know, that they are disciplined. They have discipline, and, and they also have a stability of faith. So the, the word discipline there is actually used of, of an army being in formation. You know, I, I'm not super familiar with how armies are in formation, especially back then. Um, but I kind of thought of, when you think of like the Spartans and, and whatnot, and they'd have like their, their phalanx, um, which would be their formation where they'd have, you know, the first line of defense would be down there with the shield, and then they'd have the second line of defense up there with a spear ready to stab. <laughs> and so it was very orderly. They had it perfectly set up, so they'd have a, a line of defense, and that is how our, our, our discipline and our life needs to be as well as, as part of the church. Uh, you think of so many times that uh, Christians have been called hypocrites before, and yeah. people just don't want to go to church because, like, oh no, those people are, um, you know, they're just the same as me. They have sin just like I do. I don't want to be a part of them. Um, so it's important for us as a church to uh, have a disciplined, disciplined life. It doesn't mean we don't sin, but uh, we're honest about our sin. We uh, we still seek to to serve God, and we don't just 
sin and say it's okay, but it's, we are disciplined in, in following Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, also, our, our faith. He says your faith is stable. The stability of your faith. It's firm and unshaken. Um, I think of, if, uh, I think uh, it's very interesting that he combines both of these together. Because whenever I uh, have had my faith shaken, or had my, you know, my, where my faith wasn't stable, wasn't firm, it was because in my life I wasn't being disciplined in what I was supposed to do. I wasn't doing my daily devotions and things like that. And that led to my faith being very easily shaken by the world and by, by things of that nature. Um, but for us as the church, we need to keep those things close together. We need to be disciplined in our life um, to follow God, and that will, that will lead to our, our faith being stable because we'll be able to see the, the work that God is doing and the growth that he's causing. And lastly, the fifth goal that we have, we need to continue in Christ. Uh, continue in Christ. And these are some of my favorite uh, verses in Colossians, some of the key verses, actually. actually. Um, he starts it with, therefore. So, in light of everything I've just said, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So, I want us to actually notice the phrase, as you have received him. Because a lot of times, actually, if you could go back to the verse really quick, um, Nicole, because... A lot of times people will say, all right, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And they just interpret this verse to mean, all right, you have received him, now go walk in him. But that's not what he's saying here. He's saying, as you have received him, so in the same way that you have received, received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. So you need to walk him in the same way. Actually, in the next slide, I have that written out. <coughs> So yeah, we need to, when, when it talks about walking in Him, that's how we're living for Him. We need to live for Christ in the same way that we, we receive Him. How do we receive Him? Well, it was by faith. We received Christ by faith, and now we need to uh, live for Christ by faith. Um, this is completely an affront to what the false teachers were saying, because all the different works, all the dietary laws that they were trying to add, but no, we, we received Christ by faith, and we're going to live, live for Him the same way. He goes on to explain that in verse 7. Um, how, so how exactly does this look? Having been firmly rooted and rooted, and now being built up in him, and established in your faith, just as you're instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So rooted and built up. Um, one's agricultural, one's architectural. Um, rooted is, is planted by God. He planted us. Um, built up is con- constructed by God. With Christ is the, the foundation. Um, so I, I really like the, the idea of being rooted, uh, <coughs> because to me that means that you're stuck. <laughs> you're not going to be able to be pulled out very easily. Uh, Amen. And we know, um, you know, if, if we believe we are 100% secure in Christ, uh, but not just in our salvation, but in our, our daily life as well, that God has, has planted us, and so we're, we're rooted in, in Christ. We, we always are able to... Um, you know, to return to return to God to follow Him, because He has planted us and built up. God is the one that is doing uh, the construction. Uh, when when we read these, it's having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him. God is the one that's doing the action there. It's not that I rooted myself. It's not that I'm I'm the one building myself up. Uh, it's now being built up in Him. The way that's phrased is that actions are taking place. Um, it's being the Colossians are being acted upon by something else. They're not doing it themselves. Um, they're being established in their faith by God. Um, so how are they supposed to be constructed? Or how are, how are they going to be built up? Uh, it's just as they were instructed, overflowing with gratitude. So they need to continue on with instruction, continue on with Paul's teaching, continue on with the Word of God, um, and they are to be thankful, have an attitude of gratefulness. Um, that's, that's what we need to do as a church if we're going to have an effective effective church and effective ministry here uh, which I think we do a pretty good job of this but we, we stand on God's word and God's teachings um, and we I think we have an attitude of thankfulness I mean, I, I feel like we're all very thankful to, to be here as a church thankful for what God's done uh, but we stand on God's word and, and what he has to say and I actually brought a, another verse that Paul, Paul wrote to Timothy uh, this is the last letter that Paul wrote that we have in the Bible. 
He's talking to Timothy, saying, Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me and the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. So he's telling him, man, just re retain the, the standard of sound words, that's like sound teaching, uh, which you have heard from me, and also the faith and love that are in Christ. So, yeah, retain that same, the same teaching, same style of teaching and standard of teaching that you have, and then maintain, maintain your love as well. Now in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So you give thanks for it all, everything that God's doing, we need to give thanks to Him. Uh, and lastly, for, the, for this goal, we, we see salvation is God's work, and sanctification is God's work as well. Uh, to sanctify something, it means to, to make it holy, to make it holy. When, when the priest would go into the temple and wash himself down, he, he is sanctifying himself, he's separating himself from from all the un uncleanness of the world, so he can he can approach God's uh, God's God's uh, the holy of holies, uh, God's dwelling place, and so sanctification is used of us as well as as we're go growing to be more like Christ. We're sanctified, so salvation when we're saved, and then growing as well. It's all God's work. We're to wa walk in Him just as we received Him. Uh, so these are the goals that we have. And if we want to become an effective Christ, or an effective church, we need to have encouragement, encourage one another. Uh, so think about our, you know, how well are we uh, doing at our encouragement? Is, is our goal when we're here to not just be encouraged, but to encourage others? Because uh, we need to uh, not just come and, and listen to a message and build ourselves up, but just be friendly to each other. Make, make sure that everyone, everyone feels welcome, everyone feels loved. That's the encouragement that, that we give to each other. Um, and then the unity that we have. Are, are we seeing, all right, what's going on? Hey, how can I pray for you? What kind of things do you need prayer for? What's going on in your life right now? Uh, that's, that's what's going to unify us together. Now, and then uh, seeking to you know, know Christ more, come to the complete knowledge of Christ. Uh, that's just, I mean, simply reading the Word. Not just necessarily sitting in a church and, and listening, but making sure that we are reading it on our own, it really, uh, digging deep. Uh, it's going to make us all stronger as a body when we're more grounded in God's Word. Uh, and then just seeking to have that discipline. What areas in our lives do we need to, right, Lord, you know, in this way, I'm not really doing the best I could be in living for you. Uh, you know, whether it be at work, at home, what, what areas do I need to steer towards the right path uh, to follow you better? And then, and then simply just continue in Christ. Continue in Christ by faith. Uh, not try and just do all the works on our own, but really have that trust in God that He's going to be working in us. Uh, and so the, the way I see Paul here really having that struggle, that like, these are the things that uh, you are doing, you're doing a good job in these areas, this is what I want you to do, this is what uh, you as the Colossians and Laodiceans, these are the important things that you need to be doing. So... Uh, for the effective church strategy, that, that's what he lays out for them, and uh, I, I think he lays that out for us as well. So let's close in prayer. Uh, Lord, we just thank you so much for this day. Uh, so it's another Sunday where we can just look into your word and get a message. And uh, we just thank you that we can see what Paul gives as a message to these churches, and that it applies directly in, in our time today. Uh, so we just ask you to help us to glorify you. Um, I pray for myself that you'll give me energy at work. Amen. Um, just, <laughs> just give us a good rest of the day. In Jesus' name, amen.